Hello and welcome to Equid Africa from Isheri North, Lagos, Nigeria, our weekly environmental magazine program. On today's show, we head to southern Nigeria where the Kwasiba State Government is tackling deforestation. And in Gabon, an entrepreneur is making money through waste. So we begin here in Nigeria where deforestation has made headways in the northern part of the country. Illegal logging, soil erosion and degradation has become the order of the day. But in the southern part, constructive efforts are underway to ensure forests are protected. Let's take a trip to Cross River State to see for ourselves. Nigeria's forests are in danger. They're amongst the most important ecosystems in the country and provide food and shelter for rare insects, mammals, reptile and birds. But Nigeria has one of the highest deforestation rates in the world. Between 2005 and 2010, the country lost more than 2 million hectares of forest annually. One reason for this is that rural communities cook using charcoal derived from local trees while some are exported by local syndicates. Most of the wood we chop here from our woodlands, disappear. we burn them, so we are literally burning our forest. Kerosene is expensive for some people, especially during the time of world crisis. Very few people can afford gas, that's if at all, if they know even how to use it. Electricity, how many people cook with electricity? So you see, most of uh, the people depend on the biomass. And this is causing a lot of uh, environmental hazards. Many forests are also cleared for the sake of timber production, much of which is logged illegally. In the Cross River State Province, a new program has been launched to try and stop environmental crime. The so-called Green Police are hoping to work with local communities. Now, dealing with the loggers is not just going to stand there and beat them up or shoot them down. That won't work. The green police are going to work through the communities. Because, truth be told, no stranger can walk into anybody's community and start cutting forest without the consent of the, the, the dwellers of that community. So we are developing a different, uh, we are adopting a different approach, the approach of dialogue with the communities. A separate forest protection task force was accused of fraud and ill treatment of locals, but the Green Police aims to be different. They'll be interfacing with the communities through their chiefs, the women leaders, the youth leaders, the opinion leaders and other community leaders within wherever they are sent to. They'll be working with those uh, community leaders to see to it, to appeal to them that look, if you allow strangers to come and cut down your forest, it is your children, your posterity that will suffer. But this stricter control and enforcement cannot be implemented until the Green Police begin their work. Now let's turn our attention to waste, another environmental problem which could lead to pollution and the spread of disease if not collected. According to a World Bank Urban Development Series report, Africa currently produces some 70 million tons of waste annually. Fermin Makaya is doing his bit in the West African country of Gabon. He has decided to tackle the problem head on by setting up a small company that collects and where possible recycles household trash. They have become an established team. Several times a week, men from Global Services come over to the market in Lamberen and sort the enormous waste. Organic waste goes into the pink bags and plastic in the blue. This is all done in the watchful eyes of CEO Fermin Makaya. Unfortunately here, the people are used to just throwing their garbage on the street. Many simply don't understand why they should think about waste separation and recycling. That's why we have to explain to them the importance of this over and over again. Not only the residents, but also the city administration. 
euh, auprès des, des populations, mais des administrations aussi. L'Amberen may be small, but for years, it had a big waste problem. The city waste management exists only on paper. Businessman Makaya took action. The 37-year-old founded his own private waste collection company, rented a small office, and even established a team of eight strong men. Now, they are the stars of Lamberen. It's very nice to see what they are doing here, because a clean environment helps everybody who works here. We used to have really too much garbage here, but since the people of Global Services started their operations, you can see a difference. This company is doing a great job. What really encourages us is that there is also great support from the administration side on the national level. These two tricycles transport the garbage daily to the depository on the outskirts of Lamberen. The company financed them with its initial capital. The company, Fermin Makaya, won it in a startup competition. This is the most unpleasant part of the work for the men of global services. Here is where the waste is burned. This of course isn't good, not only for the health of the people who work here, but also for the environment that we actually want to protect. Now the businessman is working together with his wife on the next step of his garbage project. They want to construct a recycling plant in the jungle of Lamberen. The plastic waste will indeed be mixed with sand to create a cement-like brick. The mass is well suited for road construction. The land has already been purchased and cleared. What's missing is the money. Of course, it's all a difficult and lengthy process. To be honest, I have sometimes thoughts of giving up. But today, I am more than convinced that we will succeed. Makaya gets the sand from a local trader and the machines from a South African recycling company with whom he is now in partnership. And by 2016, the entrepreneur plans to produce his first bricks out of waste. For many people, food is very important for living but sometimes they turn it to waste. But have you ever heard about Disco Soup, a targeted effort to save food from the trash in a party environment? Now, this movement sounds messy, but it is sprouting in many countries around the world. In today's world, there are still around a billion people who are starving. And yet, 30% of the world's food ends up in the garbage. In many Western countries, people buy more food than they need, and it goes bad. In other parts of the world, food is wasted because of poor production or storage techniques. The Disco Soup movement is trying to stop food waste. Volunteers collect perfectly edible food that supermarkets or farmers discard. Then they hire a DJ or a band. Under the rhythm of the beat, they start chopping and turn the vegetables into soup, salads, and smoothies. Free and delicious. The movement has spread across the world. We like that. Are you also doing your bit? Tell us about it. You can visit our website or send us a tweet. We'll share your story. Beautiful birds as you can see here. But if there's a bird widely associated with dry landscapes, it's the vulture. This misunderstood bird of prey plays an important role in the ecosystem. Yet in Africa, as well as many other parts of the world, they face extinction. They are often poisoned, so their body parts can be used in preparing traditional medicine or killed by poachers who fear that their presence around a carcass will alert the authorities to their illegal activities. In South Africa, the Endangered Wildlife Trust is fighting to protect the maligned creatures called vultures. When she needs to buy ingredients for her remedies, Philly Motlacidi doesn't go to a pharmacy. She goes to a muti, or a traditional medicine market in Johannesburg. 
Here she can find everything a Sangoma, a traditional South African healer, needs. It's a thriving business, but sadly also costs the lives of many endangered animals. Vultures are one prominent example. A bird like this costs the equivalent of 200 euros at the market. They use mostly the eyes, the eyes and the head, for clairvoyances. That's what they say, because it can see from a distance. So if you administer it with other medicines, your herbs, then, and then you smell it, the smoke as it burns, you smell it and then it comes into your head and your eyes, and then naturally you, can, you are able to foresee things. The healer says that Sangomas aren't actually allowed to kill animals for their medicine, but the demand is too great. So every year, hundreds of vultures end up at markets like this one. The consequences for the vulture population are disastrous. In the past 30 years, their numbers in Africa have dropped by up to 80 percent. Andre Bota manages the Endangered Wildlife Trust's Birds of Prey program, which is trying to save Africa's vultures. Vultures are the continent's waste disposal service. As scavengers, they feed on carrion, which hinders the spread of disease. Bota says that these days their greatest enemy is poison. It's easily available and inexpensive. So what you see there is how quick and easy it is to lure birds in to come and feed. And that's unfortunately what a poacher does in exactly the same way. The only difference is that they put down poison baits. They kill the birds and they then go and sell them for money. Africa's large savannas are closed ecosystems. Each animal species has a specific place in it. But time and again, the rise in poaching incidents throws the system out of equilibrium. Every 15 minutes, an elephant is killed by poachers in Africa by means of firearms or poison. Game wardens found this dead elephant in a remote stream. Andre Bota suspects it died a natural death since its tusks haven't been removed. To make things easier for the vultures to get at the massive feast, he lends a helping hand. So what we're doing is trying to open up this elephant. Uh, it's got a very thick skin, about this thick. And uh, unless there are predators, they can open up this or we come and help. The, the vultures basically don't benefit from the three tons of meat lying here. Vultures can locate a dead pachyderm in less than 30 minutes. So they pose a threat to poachers. The birds will come down in, in large numbers. Up to 400 vultures uh, will come and feed on it over a number of days. Unfortunately, in certain parts of southern Africa, poachers have taken to poisoning carcasses like this. Um, and what they do is eradicate the vultures from a particular area to host or to mask their activity so that uh, rangers can't pick up on, on what they're doing. Protecting vultures is difficult. The birds can fly long distances, up to 400 kilometers in a single day. If they die, it often has consequences far beyond the country's borders. Learning about the behavior of vultures is important. They're currently being studied by a group of researchers. But first, they have to catch one. And that takes plenty of patience. Maybe the distance isn't too far between. Okay. And an ability to sprint at the right moment. We capture these birds and then we fit these wing tags to them, we ring them and we also in some cases harness them to follow their movements, to track where they go to, where they go and find food within their range across southern Africa and that enables us to, to sort of get an idea of the areas where they potentially could be exposed to threats. Andre Bota's aim is to eliminate those threats as well as he can so that there will still be a place for vultures in the skies over southern Africa. Here in Nigeria, energy remains a recurring topic 
as billions of naira are spent annually on fuel consumption. Considering the country's geographic location around the equatorial sun belt, Nigeria has the potential to tap into renewable energy and exploit its abundant solar energy resources. In Germany, the clock is ticking for a nuclear phase-out by 2022. The country is investing heavily in renewables, but one quarter of its power is still generated from lignite, also known as brown coal, which emits even more carbon than conventional coal. What's more, open-cast mining swallows up fields, villages and even forests, such as the Hambaka Forest. For the past four years, a small number of activists have been putting their bodies online to save this ancient woodland from destruction. Take a look. Germany's coal industry heats homes, lights cities, and fuels business. But it also massively damages the environment. This open cast coal mine in Hambach extracts 40 million tons of lignite a year. Environmental activists have gone to great lengths to try to stop coal extraction here. People like Mori and Mila. Entering Hambach forest is trespassing. That's why Mila has hidden her face. This thing off. They want to stop the company clearing this forest to extract the coal underneath. We'll show you what we're going to do. We put our arms through a pipe like this, and then we'll have another pipe on the other side, and that's how we'll stop them from cutting down this tree. Hambach forest is centuries old and rich in biodiversity. But the land belongs to the power giant RWE. Four-fifths of the original trees have already been cleared. The motto of these forest activists is, fight Europe's biggest climate killer for every meter of land. They don't want any more trees chopped down for lignite with its high carbon footprint. Around two dozen activists live here on the edge of the forest. Once a month, they welcome visitors into their camp. Michal Zobel is a forestry expert. He gives locals tours of the area. Opinion here is divided when it comes to mining. Sobel wants people to see the forest, the mine, and the activists for themselves. This is the last ice age. Of course, it's not all old growth. People living here have left their mark on the land. But it is an old forest, and I want to stay that way. If you know anything about biology or forestry, then you know this is a really special forest. It's one of a kind in Europe. That so much of the forest, with its oaks and lilies of the valley, has already been destroyed for coal mine production leaves people on the tour uneasy. It's a beautiful feeling walking around in the middle of nature, then you're suddenly yanked back into reality. It gets to you. To destroy all of this just for a couple of years of coal doesn't seem This is our home, and it's all getting bulldozed to the ground. Villages are being destroyed for nothing. RWE's right to mine this land expires in 2040. After clearing Hambach Forest, RWE plans to level two villages nearby. The coal the company mines is destined for a local power plant. A huge polluter, say environmentalists. But there are arguments in favor of the mine as well. Lignite provides a reliable source of power, and this mine alone employs around 2,000 people. The target ball, uh, is, uh Mines are an important part of the economy. Mines here generate 5% of the power in Germany. God gave us a great lignite deposit here in this part of the country. And all we have to do to get it is mine it. Mori and Mila say what God gave this part of the country is not lignite. It's the trees like this 250-year-old oak. They live in a treehouse 16 meters above the ground. RWE can't cut down a tree if people are living in it. The young couple have made themselves a cozy home, and so far the power company has left them in peace. 
the future of Hambach Forest and the lignite beneath it is still uncertain. It will depend first and foremost on whether Germany can develop a renewable energy sector strong enough to replace polluting lignite. And we're back to Nigeria, located on the equator and blessed with an abundant amount of renewable energy resources, chief amongst them being the sun. But the use of solar for the generation of electricity has remained somewhat minimal, yet the conversation around it continues. Well, I went out in Lagos to meet with Henry Boyo, who is doing his beat for the environment and to see the appreciation for solar energy rise. Meet Dr. Henry Boyo, a physics lecturer at the University of Lagos. He designed the Zero Net Energy Building with the aim of reducing environmental emission and pollution. The building produces as much energy as it uses. With the global trend towards sustainability and energy efficient consumption, Dr. Boyo uses solar energy to generate heat using a parabolic satellite dish. Who needs fossil fuel or gas when the sun is available? As the sun rays reflect on the panels, Dr. Boyo tests the level of heat generated from the solar cooker with a piece of paper, a log of wood, and an activated carbon. So it burns without smoke and uh, it's clean energy. At 176 degrees Celsius to 211 degrees Celsius, the temperature is high enough to power the equipment he uses. With a pot in hand and the heat generated, cooking just got easier. All right, three, let's make it four, so that we eat one, two. What we have is the re reflection of the sun rays. These rays, I mean, the waves from the sun carry energy and the energy is focused to where we put the pots. So at the focal point is the image of the sun. And because the sun is really hot, the image is expected to be very hot. So what we're doing is we are using this parabolic concentrator with the films, reflector films there, to bring the image together and concentrate it on the pot there. It's nice the egg has cracked. Uh, so it's real egg. <laughs> <laughs> Within five minutes, at the temperature of 210 degrees Celsius, wow. generated by the solar cooker, the egg is hard boiled and ready for consumption. Wow. Let me show you the body. You love it. Oh, so that they don't think that's a uh, Nigerian. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they will pick on. So, hard Cheers. boiled egg. <laughs> Mmm. 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 <laughs> In just less than five minutes. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Mm. Can so you see the taste is different from different. the conventional? It could actually taste mm -hmm. the, Na egg, natural. the eggness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the natural. And can you see the yolk? Surrounded by refractory bricks and logs of wood, the smoked fish dryer is one that we can't leave out. It has a lot of uh, refractories around it and these are high quality refractory bricks. And so the burning chamber, the combustion, the wood burns inside this uh, burning chamber. And so when the wood burns here, all the energy is conserved within the box. Nothing goes out. Now the fish is inside here. This is a drying compartment. Inside here, you can see. Dr. Boyer explains how the dryer conserves energy. Four or five layers of fish for drying. And um, the reflector of the cover, the cover acts like the solar concentrator. It reflects the heat energy back on top of the fish, increasing the efficiency, the efficient use of the um, heat energy. So um, Eventually, we'll find out that this device uses one quarter the amount of wood uh, the conventional uh, fish dryer uses. By making use of renewable energy resources and energy conservation techniques, our eco-hero Henry Boyo 
is doing his bit in Lagos, Nigeria by reducing wastage and environmental degradation to its barest minimum. So, he is doing his bit for the environment. What are you doing? We would like to know, and we can help you tell the world how you're helping to protect the environment. Get in touch through the website, email, and social media platforms showing on your screen. Tell us what you're doing. That's a much you can take on the show for today. I want to thank you for being a part of it. So we'll bring you another edition. Bye-bye. <laughs>